Hi, my name is Shelby Redfield Kilgore. Thank you so much for coming to this channel that I have dedicated to all things foster care and adoption related. I really, really hope that you will subscribe, like, and comment, and also share with your friends, family, and community. Oink, 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 oink. Yahoo, people! Yeah, that's our little secret handshake we do. My name is Margie Fink, and we have adopted four kids out of foster care. We have two sets of two siblings, and we run a nonprofit that helps resource foster and adoptive families called Transfiguring Adoption. And then we also teach English online. And I'm Darren Fink, I am Margie's husband, and I am the project director of Transfiguring Adoption. We believe media, it, it has the power to be able to help children work through trauma, and it gives, it gives everyone language and words to be able to walk the children through safely and without judgment. Hi, I'm Jasmine, I am 15, almost 16, and I was five years old when I came to my last foster home, which ended up being my adoptive home. My name is Owen Fink. I'm 12 and 3 quarter years right now. I was 22 months when I came to my foster home, which became my permanent home. And this is my brother that I came with to my, my last foster home. My name is Cody. I'm 20. I was 5 when I went to foster care and 10 when I went to my last foster home which became my adopted home. My dad left right when I was, like around when I was born because he wasn't ready to have, have kids. Um, my mom had a mental disability. So I don't really blame her for a lot of what happened, um, but she did live with some people, like we lived in a trailer home and there were like maybe, okay there's two, four, Six, me six, and you. Six adults, and then me, me and him, and then another girl. And the girl abused me, the people that we lived with abused me and abused Dalton. And when Dalton was born, I basically became his, like acted like his mother, so I basically became a mother at three years old. The people that lived with us weren't related to us, but they were practically like family. I basically had a sister, and she was older than me, and then I, I was supposed to have, I think, another sister, but she died like very early, so they cremated her and they put her in this little wooden box that was sealed, you know, because it's like, it's like an urn, you have ashes in it, and it had the picture of the baby. I just remember seeing that, I'm like, I could have had a little sister, but then I have this little brother. Hi, I remember guys. seeing him for the first time, I'm like, I got a little brother, and I was thinking like, I was like so happy. And that was, was way kinder until I see you in the face. Yeah, I remember <laughs> <laughs> holding him for the first time and he got he was throwing a fit and he <laughs> kicked me in the face. We met at a campus ministry at, in college at Illinois State University. We were at a conference for Christmas and I remember swing dancing with him and he doesn't remember that. And I remember thinking he was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was a love at first sight. We were both on a drama team. For a while, we both liked each other, but we didn't know that we liked each other. But like all of our friends knew that we each liked each other. They were all being very great about not telling us. They actually put together a drama for us to star in where a guy liked a girl and he had he was nervous and was going to ask her out. It was hilarious for them. And we're sitting there up on, or standing there on stage going, that wasn't even a funny line. Like, why is everyone <laughs> laughing? And we're just like, are we that good? Because they all, they all, they all knew, knew that he really wanted to ask me out, but 
just didn't, I don't know, have the nerve yet or something. But it was probably what, like four or five months later. We did go on, uh, on a retreat for juniors and seniors and uh, we went for a long walk and that's where we kind of, not kind of, I did ask you out. <laughs> Neither one of us remembers what our first date was. Yeah, that's really weird because people ask us all the time, what, what, <laughs> so what was your first date? And we're like, we made it to many more past that. You want to talk about those? <laughs> like, hey, we don't know what the first one was. So there was a first date. We just, we have no clue. I don't remember if it was on my birthday or something, but me and my mom baked a cake. It was a big chocolate cake and I didn't use any utensils or anything. I just shoved a piece in my mouth and it was covering my face and I was like, this is awesome because, you know, we didn't really have cake that often and like we didn't really have food that often either. So it was a bit, it was a really happy day for me and there was a couple times where it would just be me and my mom we would sit down and we would watch like a cartoon Dracula or something, I can't remember what it was called. And it was just a cartoon. It was it was funny, and I would always watch it with her. And so yeah, I think that was a really fun memory. And then the proposal, we were both over at my apartment, and the date for that night was going to be we were going to do a painting together. And I was going to show her how to do some painting with oils and different things like that. We made a painting that that had to do with our relationship. And you had like a mix. A mixtape, you know, that was back when we oh had cassette goodness. tapes. We are so <laughs> old. <laughs> a mixtape of songs that were important to us that we're playing. And then while you were cleaning up, when you came back, it was so funny because I got I was I got down on my knee and you had no idea what was going on. She got down on her I knee. I thought too. he was just getting down, like gonna sit on Let's the floor sit down or and something. Talk. And so I started and then I was like, Oh and you're is like, what This we're is the doing. moment, this is the moment. And then she shot back up again. But uh, you did say yes. I did. So, yeah, it was, that was a good night. <laughs> Everybody would leave in the morning and come back late at night. So I would be stuck with him and the other girl. And she would abuse me. And I would try to protect him from basically being abused. I remember... My mom would bottle the milk, so I remember how I have to feed him and having to basically you know, mother be him. my mother. And you were a very nice mother then. Well, as nice as a five year four year old could be. Wait. And then when what happened when you were five? Did you stop with that instinct? Um, no, I'm I'm still trying to get over it. <laughs> For me, foster care and adoption was something, I don't ever remember it not being something that I was passionate about, even as a child. Um, when I was a child, my dad died when I was 11, and I, from a very young age, knew that my dad was very sick. He had a heart attack in front of me when I was four, and so I always knew that my time with him was limited. The idea of just how fragile life was. And then it, right after my dad died, my mom actually got custody of one of my cousins and he lived with us as a newborn for a year and a half. This was, you know, my dad died, my mom lost her job, and then my cousin came to live with us. It was all just kind of um, a very intense season of life. But so, I, and I always had a lot of compassion. Um, it was just something, it was just a part of me. And then we went to teach English in Korea for two years and while we were there I had the opportunity to do a lot of work in the orphanages. I would go and volunteer to teach English and just play with the kids and when we came back to the States, um, you know, we had always kind of talked about foster care and adoption but then we started actually trying to have biological children and we found out that we couldn't. So it was just kind of like the kick in the pants to do something that we wanted to do anyways. So um, that was probably 2008 we decided that we were gonna start the process to foster. Mm -hmm. I think growing up, no, I didn't have any dreams of fostering or adopting, but I mean, I, I remember growing up and people always said that I would be a good dad. And so being a dad is something that I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I think where I came into the story was because we couldn't have children. I'm not sure if this is actually a memory or a dream, like I asked my biological mom, I didn't really, I don't really remember getting a real answer, but I remember waking up in a crib, climbing out of the crib, and then walking around and being chased by 
one of her ex-boyfriends and he was wearing a scream mask. So from a very early age, I was terrified of Scream. I also remember they used to watch horror films like Chucky, and now I've got a permanent fear of dolls. We were walking through, I think, Fort Christmas or something like that, and they had this doll in one of the attics, and it looked like Chucky. <laughs> I walk up to the <laughs> attic, and I see it, and I run down the stairs. So I'm like, I am not going into any more attics. <laughs> so, from that I developed a permanent theory of dolls. I hear people talking about their infertility issues or not being able to have children, and I hear a lot more grief in their stories than I think I've ever heard us talk about. For us, it was simply, it's not going to happen this way, so we'll go on to this way. To say that there was no grief would be a lie. You hear all the stories. People talked about, like, what would it be like if, if we had a baby that had your eyes and my hair, you know, like all those stories. Sometimes I think it wasn't even so much grief as it was just curiosity. Yeah. Like, what would a child that we had together be like? And I think the grief more comes in in the fact that we weren't there when our kids were babies. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have that experience with them. Our youngest was 22 months when he came to us, and the others were five, nine, and 10. And then we had kids that were kind of the eight to 11, and then we had a 16-year-old. So we had nine kids total. And it's just when I see pictures of them as babies, I wish I could go back and hold them or when I know that there were things that they missed out on or times that they had gotten hurt or you know, trauma that they had gone through. It's kind of the grief that we weren't there to be able to see their first or help them or, or protect them. Someone might say, well, you know how you know, that can be with a baby and you're like, no, actually I don't. <laughs> like, and, and you're half saying it like, I, I honestly don't. And then you start thinking about our children are like, man, I wish we could have been there for our kids when that happened and had that experience. I didn't take showers because we ne they never t let us take showers. So I was constantly dirty. I remember having lice and they cut my hair. I was used to be seeing cockroaches. You would n rarely see them any smaller than that. Like they were huge. And the living conditions were bad and I was starved. Like basically I didn't know what was food and what wasn't food so I would put everything in my mouth. I was chewing on bed springs and because of that I actually later developed, I would hoard food and I have finally, you know, learned you don't hoard food. We have, we have a lot, enough food to eat but for a while I actually didn't know like what it was like to have food in your pantry and what it was like to have a clean home. For us, it was never really a question. We didn't ever pursue any kind of fertility treatments because for us, it was like there are so many kids that need homes. Why would we force another child into our kind of overpopulated world? I mean, we, we talked about it and we thought, but I mean, it, we just kept coming back to the same conclusions. Like, why go through all this when and they're it's obviously... Just, I, I would say, you know, in terms of fertility, infertility, there's that grief of every month when it doesn't happen. And so it was like, why would we put ourselves through that? Um, you know, it's expensive or, you, and it is emotional and it's not guaranteed to work. And for, for me, it was just, there are kids that need homes. There's half a million kids in foster care. There are a hundred thousand of them are ready for adoption. Why, why go this way when these kids need homes? Mm. I have lots of love toward my mom. I know like being a Christian, you're not supposed to hate, you're supposed to love your enemies, but I have a lot of hate for one of the, the guys who, uh, who I lived with because he would always be threatening me. He never said one kind word to me. We used to have this um, cage that was full of wild rabbits that they would, because um, my mom's boyfriend would go out hunting and he would bring back deer when we needed venison that night, or he'd bring back a bunch of rabbits and we would eat some of that. 
but I remember I did something, I don't remember what. He threatened to throw me into the wild rabbit, rabbit cage. And, you know, wild rabbits, they have claws. I like, I had no desire to go in there, so I made sure I stayed away from him for the rest of the day. I don't care where he is right now, I hope he's in jail, because he sexually abused me. And basically, I remember not being able to wake up for a few days because he would beat me. I would wake up with bruises everywhere. And so, I, I know this sounds really bad for a person, but I honestly hate him and I wish that I had never met him and I hope that he is in jail right now. And he, that he won't hurt anybody else. Because I also know that he abused some of the women in, our, in the house too. I don't think he abused my mom, but he abused at least his, his girlfriend. Did the so, classes prepare us for foster care? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, and some of it is, you know, I try, it's been, you know, 11 years. Yeah, yeah, 11 years. So when I think back about the classes the first time we went to foster, you know, you kind of have like the rose colored glasses and I think some things kind of go over your head. When you haven't experienced something, you don't always catch everything, I think. Um, but there's also a lot of, you know, the 27, 30 hours of class that's spent on fill out this paperwork and this paperwork. And so there's a lot of policy and procedure, and especially 11 years ago when we were starting to get licensed, there was a lot less focus on trauma mm -hmm. and being trauma informed. Absolutely. So I think there might have been little snippets, but even as far as parenting, you know, there wasn't a lot of hey, you really need to come up with some different parenting strategies. Parenting a child from trauma should look different than a child with attachment issues. You don't want to send them to timeout. You need to do different methods of parenting. Um, and a lot of the trip, typical things, the way we were parented, kind of backfired. You know, in those early years, we were stumbling around going, why isn't this working? This is what our parents did, and this is what every other parent that we know did. Why is it not work? So um, I think we absolutely did not feel prepared mm -hmm. um, in the beginning. The second time around, you know, that was 2016 or 17, and the agency that we got licensed with was focusing a bit more on trauma. But again, it was trauma. like, s still they only had limited hours. And mm -hmm. trauma is like, you could get a doctorate in trauma and still learn more. Um, so, and I think as foster and adoptive parents, we have to be really, ongoing lifelong students. It got put in a little bit more, but it was still, I think, well, not quite enough. Whenever we were basically moved to a foster home, we were always moved together. In the foster care system, they don't really want to separate siblings unless they're forced to. Everybody loved him because he was a baby. So... No one loved you? Yeah, well, one didn't, but I'm not going to really go into that. Okay, sorry. I... But we were always moved together, and I was and that's always... that's a fun thing. One thing that was really important to me, with the, for the, at least with the first few homes, was I had to be near him because I had the mothering instinct, basically, because I had to take care of him for the first few months of his life when it, until he was taken away. So... I always felt like I had to be near him. I'm still going through the fact where I'm like, my mom will have to tell me, I'm the mother, you don't have to, you don't have to be worried about this so and everything because the instinct's still there. Jasmine and Dalton were our first foster placement and Jasmine had just turned five and Dalton was 22 months. I remember driving in the car and I'm a very optimistic person. So I was like in my head thinking, this is gonna be a, the family that I'm gonna stay with. Because every time I went to a family, I, I always thought, hey, this is most likely gonna be my new forever home. Because I realized that even at age four when I was taken away from my biological family, that I most likely wasn't gonna go back. And I, to be honest, I didn't really want to go back. 
it was an emergency placement. And so we knew they were coming over that day, but our cat had gotten sick, so I had the cat at the vet, and then I, I so had I just- So I was by myself, <laughs> kind of freaking out. I remember driving here, being very optimistic with a smile on my face, and I hopped out, and, I, and she was sitting on the steps. I ran up to her and I'm like, this is my new home, you're my new mom, and then I run into the house and he's just sitting there like, cautious and being like, he, he, he didn't really speak, so he wouldn't say much things. He, he could say mom and dad and that's pretty much about it. Jasmine just kind of bounded up the front steps and said, you're my new mom and this is my new house. And she just kind of walked in. <laughs> and Dalton was definitely shell-shocked. So by the time I got home though, I remember Jasmine just bounding up to the back door going, hey, you're my new dad, bye. And like, <laughs> oh, I was like, okay. Um, and then uh, I remember seeing Dalton and he just had these just deer in a headlight look. And I remember picking him up kind of just to give him a hug. And he was like, okay, this guy's safe enough. I don't want to go anywhere else because he just had deer in a headlight look. Um, and we were placement number five in eight months. So from 15 months to 22 months, he had bounced a lot. He kind of just looked around a lot, he cried. I don't remember him calling them mom or dad at first. Um, I just remember him being very shy and yeah, just very shy and closed off. I just remember being very happy. Um, well, I remember being really shy. <laughs> That's basically all I remember. He didn't have a lot of language yet, so he had a hard time communicating, so there was a lot of screaming. Dalton had night terrors. He had just been moved around and he was so little. Those are the scariest thing that I've ever had to deal with. And then I, I was a new dad, you know, and I'm, I have a kiddo that's waking up in the middle of the night and he's screaming and he can't tell me what's wrong. And I think he's awake, but he's kind of asleep and he's kind of awake and he's still screaming. And so what, like, those were scary for me. Since we've been on our journey, had people tell us, you know, when you begin foster care, when you get a new kiddo in your home, cocoon your family. On Sunday, you're not going to church. Um, you're, you know, you go to work because you got to pay the bills. But then you're coming home. You're not having grandma and grandpa over. You're not having friends over to meet people. You're for for a month or so. You're just, it's your family. That's it, so that everyone good learns. things only come from mom and dad and the affection and just, we, we've learned so much about bonding now that had we known back then, um, we would have structured things a lot differently. Plus, the week that Jasmine and Dalton moved in, his grandfather died and then it was gonna be Thanksgiving. So we ended up three days in, they had just moved into our home and then we went for a week to his parents' house for funeral and Thanksgiving and everything. So it was kind of, but, we did everything wrong. <laughs> but like, in so many ways. I can remember having to watch Dalton carefully because everyone was mom and dad to him. So he would just go to any stranger. There was definitely a honeymoon period. Mm -hmm. um, we, I would say, did not bond with the kids immediately. And I mean, we talked about that. I we, think we did more than you, you think that we did because right away the caseworker like the first week came over and said, would you adopt them if it came to that? And we said, absolutely, yes. But I do remember having conversations with other people and we were kind of like, huh. It was kind of an aha moment with, it's okay that we don't feel that way because these other people have had nine months to carry a child and they automatically have this bond with their kids um, because of that. And we haven't had that. So it, I remember there were times when we gave ourselves permission that it was okay that we didn't feel immediately like just right there attached with our kids, that we, we felt a little off or we felt, um, I remember having those times. We had a lot of food issues with kids. There's been a tendency to either want to overeat at the dinner table, like I'm, I'm talking like eating and eating and eating until you get sick um, or hoarding food or, um, We've even had, we've had severe, like, kids with, like, it sounds weird to say picky because everyone's like, oh, that kids are picky with food all the time. Like, and I, no, like, really, like, texture issues and different things like that. So a lot of food stuff. Normal took a long time because of the fact that 
Jasmine and Dalton moved in in November, and then by January, we had met the boys, and they're eight and 10 at the time, and they had actually been in care for almost five years, and they had been in six homes previous to us, so we were home number seven. We started doing transitional visits over that spring, and then they moved in in the summer. So in six months-ish, we went from zero, zero to four, Mm -hmm. And we had kind of gotten a good groove when it was just Jasmine and Dalton, and then we had kind of started to get to normalcy, what, whatever that was, and the right. boys moved in, and then it was just chaos. There was just a lot of dynamics of the kids kind of figuring out their pecking order. Jasmine and Cody actually, for a while, they would fight about who was the firstborn. And I don't know where they even learned the word firstborn, but that was um, a big thing for them. And so it took a while. Um, it took a lot of going to counseling and everybody kind of working together and trying to figure out how do we function as this family of six with all these different moving parts. And, you know, with Cody and Matthew, we knew they were going to be adopted. With Jasmine and Dalton, um, you know, the goal was still return home for quite some time. So 2008, they moved in. Adoption wasn't till 2012. A lot of that was foster care, and that's just unknown. And so it's hard as foster parents to kind of, you want to, you have to attach, you need to attach, they need you to attach, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're kind of guarded too. And the kids as well, I mean, they've had several placements. Um, so it's, it's hard for everybody to kind of figure out what is my role and how do I connect with these people? And, you know, for the boys, for as long as they could really remember, like their whole verbal life had been bouncing from home to home. They didn't know what it meant to stay in a place. We would go to therapy and um, one of them would say, well, when we move again, and therapists kept saying, you're, you're getting adopted, you're staying here. There was not a, even a concept that they understood. I remember too, the, the day that we started talking about when adoptions finalized and caseworkers not coming over anymore. And all the kids, all they ever remembered was casework, you know. They thought every kid in the world had a caseworker that came and checked on them, you know, every week or at least once a month. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like a foreign concept to not have a caseworker. So I remember when I first went to, when I went to my, the parent I live now, I was, I was um, kind of the brat at the time. And I was like, I wasn't, like I had a different mood. And I um, love them now. But with Cody, he had so many moves. So for us to say, this is your home, you're going to, this is it. Um, he didn't believe it. Um, the previous home that he had been in, he had, he had loved the foster home. Um, he loved the foster parents. He loved their family. He wanted to go back to that. Hate's kind of a strong word, but he really probably kind of hated us. When you look back on it, it was like, that was a very normal reaction because he had been bounced around so much, you know, and he really did. He loved his last foster parents. He wanted to go back there. He didn't understand why he couldn't go back there. It's funny because he didn't, he doesn't even remember, you know, because now it's like, this is the family that I love. And this is, you know, um, he'll talk about this being a great family. And it's funny because we said, look at these pictures from like the early months. We did family pictures and he's like, and every once in a while you see like where he's really, really trying hard not to smile. Everything in him, like I, I'm gonna be hateful, I'm gonna be mad, I don't wanna do this. Um, and every once in a while you'd see these like corners pop up. But it was, it was an adjustment for all of us. Becoming a family, I guess, and loving each other and bonding, I don't think it, I think it was a process. In general, this whole journey, there are so many times when you don't realize how things are happening until you look back. You know, there are times when you, I remember a time where I was upset about a behavior that a child was exhibiting, and then I thought, 
you know, so many months back, this would have been a three hour rage and meltdown. And, you know, this is, this is a child really dealing with this very well. And I think with bonding and the attachment, I think kind of the same way, it's a process. And I don't think there are a whole lot of like, this was the moment that I can say, you know, that, okay, we're, we're attached. But um, with Cody, there was a, was a moment. We were driving almost two hours one way to get his braces. And I've never seen a child so excited about braces. He really, really wanted braces. And so we were driving. That was the closest place that his insurance would cover. So on the drive, we were passing the town where we were gonna finalize adoption. So we were probably, I don't know, a month or so out and we're driving through the town and I point out, I say, hey, you see that building with the blue awning? You know, there's, there's a big roof back there. That's the courthouse. That's where we're gonna go and we're gonna finalize adoption. And he didn't say much. And then we went to the orthodontist. He got his braces put on and it was late by the time we got home because we had, it was a four hour round trip and putting braces on takes a while. So we get home and go to bed and the next morning he, Darren comes up to me in the kitchen and says, who did you bring home? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, he's totally different. And we saw in that one day, we saw him go from unaffectionate to affectionate, from pessimist to optimist, from wanting nothing to do with us to your mom and dad. And I think it was a combination. I mean, he really was excited about the braces, but adoption was no longer this abstract thing. There was a place um, and it was happening and it, I think it just, it all kind of clicked and it, it was an overnight change. Um, one of few things that we have ever seen, you know, that we can go back to a moment and say, this was a huge change. What are some good memories that you have with this family? That I guess when I first got adopted, I guess, that's when I, um, that's when I realized this is like my, my, um, my home that I, um, would stay. And that's when I, like, realized that, um, I would stay at this house, this home, and it would become my, my, uh, my parents. When we first started fostering, we lived in Illinois, and then after adoptions and Darren lost his job, we ended up moving to Tennessee, and we were there for six years, mm -hmm. and then we've lived in Florida for a little over a year. It seems like there's always some kind of adjustment going on. So I don't really know what normal is, <laughs> and I don't know that any family really has um, always a normal. Mm. You know, I think... In a lot of ways, the move from Illinois to Tennessee was stressful for the kids, but at the same time, I think there was some comfort in the fact that we were going as a family. I know for at least one of our kids, that move really helped with kind of getting some separation from trauma um, that they had experienced because this particular child, it was kind of like, I'm not gonna run into anybody who hurt me. Um, so in some ways, there was almost this feeling of safety in that we're, there's some distance between kind of the past and this new life that we're kind of all starting together in a new state. And there was also some kind of comfort in that there were behaviors that had happened prior to adoption just kind of in that that long period of time and the unknown that those behaviors a lot of them had just fallen off after adoption uh, because of that security of hey i i know where i'm going to be now there's not this th all those years of hey can i have this for christmas or can i be this for halloween and you're saying as the caregivers i can't promise you that you know i can't tell you for sure it was kind of a fresh start in a lot of ways I guess the big difference for our family as a whole was going from Illinois to Tennessee was the move was decided for us. Not I, made for us in that someone else right, told us we had to go right. to Tennessee. It was, 
he lost his job and there's a job in Tennessee. And moving from Tennessee to Florida, we made that decision as a family yeah. that so we wanted I think to go. It, relationally for all of us, it was a little bit harder because we'd kind of established some good roots in Tennessee, but it was a decision that we all made together. One thing that people don't think about is our kids, when they were in foster care and they bounced from home to home to home, they weren't read the same stories that all of the, like that most kids are used to growing up. They didn't have uh, Grimm's fairy tales. They didn't have you know the nursery rhymes. We didn't know anything about Harry Potter or even Mickey Mouse. We never <laughs> grew up with that stuff. And so one of the things we wanted to do is encourage um, reading with them and also learning how to pretend and play. They really yeah. lacked. You know, oh, there's yeah. some things that you think are innate, like beep, beep, zoom, zoom with a car. But if you've never seen a toy car, we learn, they become projectiles. <laughs> they do. They're, we just throw them. <laughs> and we have to teach you how to play with cars. They were trying to get us into the Harry Potter series, so we started reading the first book. And then I, I remember Matthew breaking down. He's a kid who is emotionally guarded. Just kind of a lot of disconnect from emotions. He didn't tend to know I'm happy, I'm tired, I'm hung, you know, physically or emotionally. Um, and he didn't talk a lot about his trauma. And so it was just kind of one of those moments where like, what's going on here? And, and he started tearing up and we said, hey, what's going on? He started saying, I can relate to Harry Potter. So we said, really, tell us about it. And he kind of started just talking about all this stuff that he had experienced that had never been shared before and we kind of started using the story as a way of being able to talk about different feelings, different trauma, different things that have happened, you know, in the past. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of safety in being able to talk about a character. You can talk about a character and process stuff without ever saying that happened to me. We kind of realized what, what the characters in the book, like, going through. And we just kind of connect to it. The kids really were getting into it and they said, you know, we want to start this blog where we would read a chapter at the dining room table at dinner and, and they would say, this is what a foster or adoptive child can get out of this chapter. These are questions that a family can ask. These are things you can discuss. I started writing and he started doing book reviews and I still for little do. kids. And then I Sometimes I would help my mom with older book review, like older kid book reviews, and then sometimes, and then she has one for their adults. And so they really kind of wrote this chapter by chapter discussion guide for the Sorcerer's Stone, and we would go through and do the same thing for the parents. And you know, just a couple weeks into the blog development, and we were at the celebration of Harry Potter in the Wizarding World, and we started talking to somebody because. Darren saw somebody with a camera, and so Darren's, I saw, I'm, his I'm, instinct is, hey, what are you doing? I always get into little things, and, and I, I asked this gal, I'm like, hey, I see you got a camera and a microphone, what's going on? She was part of a national mom blog, and she's like, this is my husband, he works for a father fathering blog. Um, so we're talking, and I said, oh yeah, we just started a blog, and she said, oh yeah, what's it called? And I said, at the time it was called, we, the kids named it Hogwarts Adoption, and I'm like, she's like, oh, I know you guys, I follow you guys, and I'm like, no, no, you don't. We're two weeks old. I'm like, there's no... And she, sure enough, she's like pulling up her Instagram account. She's like, this, your, this is you, right? And um, we went around and someone else recognized our blog. Um, we got back home from vacation and the newspaper had left a message on our voicemail saying they wanted to get a hold of us and do a news story on us. Um, so that was really weird for us to, to be getting attention like that. Um, so we ended up obviously calling <laughs> an attorney really quick and saying, uh, I've got this blog that's getting attention and it's called Hogwarts. He's like, yep, you're going to change the name tomorrow or yes, today. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it became Transfiguring Adoption. It's got big enough where we started going to Comic Cons. Whenever my dad told me that Chris Rankin, who plays, you know, Percy Weasley, we, that we... He was adopted. He was adopted and he was very interested in what we had to, like, to do. I'm like, what? <laughs> we are talking um, at a convention with Chris Rank, and he actually pursued us and had a conversation with us further, and he's been helping us out with uh, projects, and he's become part of this movement. And it's morphed into, we now have reviewers that do video game reviews, uh, which is a new thing since this was made. Um, movies and, uh, and, and scads of other books. 
And we also started, what can we do to resource families? What can we do to kind of help be the oxygen mask for them so that they can parent better? And so we start, you know, we've got bloggers on there. We've got a whole section that's, you know, adult adoptees, former foster youth, even some current foster youth in there. Helping kids from traumatic pasts is a big issue and it's a moving target and there's so much that goes with it. Our family kind of helped get the ball rolling with this, but it's really turning into a movement of people that are concerned about families. As long as we have a movement, we can do something. We can have positive change and we can change the world with a movement, but with just us, we, yeah, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> like this nonprofit, uh makes me happy um, because we started it as a family. We um, like we read the Harry Potter movies, like we read the books, we saw the movies, um, we connected to it. We started uh, we started this as a family, and it makes me happy. Therapists have been integral <laughs> for our family's existence. Like, um, I think- And I would say we've had very, very good therapists and very, very bad therapists. Mm -hmm. And I think the most effective therapies that we've seen have been those that have incorporated everybody. Dr. Karen Purvis um, would always say, damage that's done in relationship has to be healed in relationship. So, it's that family dynamic, those relationships that really, that's where a lot of the healing has to take place. And so, to, you know, there's some things that have to be done individually. There are some individual things, but, you know, a lot of the greatest therapies we've seen have been when there's some individual work, but overall it's kind of in connecting everybody and working together. I had an attachment disorder. Uh, so basically, when at a very young age, I didn't have a father figure. So there was always a part of my heart that I needed to fill. And because I was neglected, I needed to have all the love and like all the affection. So I would quickly try to attach myself to any, to any adults. Equine therapy mm -hmm. has, was, has been, we don't have that here, but in Tennessee we had um, equine therapy for the kids. And it was, it was really, really good. Remember with the therapy with the horses? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. We we went actually to a few places with horses in equine therapy. We had one that was up in the mountains, and we had one that was closer to our house, and then there was one, another one back in the mountains. And I was <laughs> learning how to groom them and stuff, but also learning about how, how the to... horses mirror your emotions. Like... So the horses mirror our attitudes and our feelings. There's, they're, they're able to sense a lot of that. So. Um, I remember a specific time when one of the kids was working with a horse and the horse was just really r being rebellious and resistant and the therapist was able to say, you know, this is what's happening with you and the horse is mirroring kind of your attitude. And so and I learned very quickly if I was angry, a horse would get angry and they would buck and they wouldn't let you near them. If a child is, is not confident, like the horse picks up on the fear and they become fearful too. So there's a lot of like self-esteem and confidence things that there's so much that is able to be done in the space of equine therapy. The kids don't feel like they're in therapy. They're just doing something fun with horses. If you were not feeling uneasy, they would be uneasy and they would be very shifty and you couldn't, again, you couldn't really get near them. If you're happy, they'll be happy, and if you're excited, they'll be excited and want to take you around. There might have been outbursts at home before going to equine, and then on the car ride over, like, you know, everyone puts on their mask, and we go into equine therapy. The therapist would be like, so how, how are you doing at home? And, you know, like, a kiddo would be like, great. And she'd be like, okay, I don't believe you. And why? Like, because your horse is doing, is bucking around or is doing this, so something's going on. The therapist would press them, like, there's something going on that you're not telling me about because your horse, your horse's attitude doesn't lie. Um, and 100% and of the time, it, what, they're, what, like, they, the kiddo would say, 
well, okay, right before we came over here. Um, and then when they were able to process through things and talk through things, the horse would actually settle down and start to mind them and they were able to work with the horse for the rest of the time. The equine's amazing. It's just, it's, I, I never thought that we'd get that much out of it. I thought it was just a fancy way for kids to go play with horses, but it's amazing. <laughs> Well, when I used to get angry, I used to pick up stuff and throw stuff. And that turned out, and that didn't turn out well. So I reacted on myself, which it kind of hurt. Because I, when I get angry and try to react on it, I usually go with like this with one of my action figures. And then it hurt, it literally hurt. And I had a big yellow truck then too. When we foster, when we adopt, there are so many times that parenting, we are triggered and we see things. There are things that you know we thought maybe that we dealt with or things that we didn't realize that we needed to deal with. Um, a lot of that can be brought up in fostering and, and adopting. Um, you know, some of our own past things get triggered. And so we would take the kids to therapy and then end up kind of getting our own sessions in the meantime to to, to process some of the things that we had gone through as kids. Okay, so I remember being young when I was younger and I would basically, if I would get angry, I remember I would throw these humongous tantrums and okay. I would, I remember one time like tearing up every book that I could see and throwing it down the stairs and um, I, rem I remember that I did a lot of traumatizing stuff that would be traumatizing probably to my parents. And, well, so, I'm sorry. But um, I remember that's the reason why I would have these outbursts because I would hide my feelings until the very last minute. Whenever that happens, it only takes one small thing to like, you know, snap. I think there, there might be in some circles there's a, a perception that if you go to a therapist there's something majorly wrong, like you're a whack job, you know, like you're, you're cuckoo nuts. And it's just not, to be help, healthy you need to see someone that can walk through things that you're not equipped to walk through. Um, and your friends aren't equipped to walk through uh, because they haven't had the training either. I remember my dad and my mom just looking at me and after I ripped up all the books, they were like, I don't remember exactly what they said, but I remember basically on their faces, it was like, are you done? And then they, we, we would talk about it. And I remember where Tearing I would shirt. get depressed and stuff and I would physically hurt myself. And I remember my mom wouldn't let me, she would, it might sound like a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing. Um, she would hold me down, basically, and tell me that, if my dad, dad, dad did the same, basically they would tell me, I will let you go when you're not a danger to yourself and to, any, and to other people. And, you know, they're, they're both pretty strong. Good so after lesson. a while, I would get tired, and I would be like, okay, okay, I'm done, I'm done. And then we would talk about it. We're really quick to tell people, too, like sometimes you gotta watch with how deep you go with your kids too and you need to have a therapist for your family because if you open up trauma and look at it mm -hmm. you got to be able to um, you got to be able to leave the session or, or leave the conversation still being able to deal with your life and live your life without the trauma having taken over um, and a therapist can, can help you do that where ma and pa necessarily can't help you um, do that. I thought I could, you know, I can handle this myself and stuff, like all my emotions, so I'd keep it hidden and I would be like a happy, cheery person and then I'd go to bed and then I'd cry silently and I would get up in the morning and be all happy and cheery and then it was just like a routine after a while. You'd cry, The cry, sadness cry. or anger or depre like depression would get build up so much that one thing, like someone saying, what's wrong, with what's going on with you? would make me snap and I would scream or yell or hurt myself. I would go run up to my room and hurt myself. It's like a dam and like a, a lake would be filling up and filling up. It would be building pressure on the dam. And if you don't let the gates open and let a little bit, a little bit of water out, you know, it's going to keep filling up and filling up and filling up and then it'll start to break the dam and all of a sudden it'll come out in one big burst. 
basically what happens with your emotions whenever you hide them. I'm quite the little actress, and he's quite the little, he's a quite the little actor. Oh, he's a drama king, I'm a drama queen. All my friends are always like, Jasmine, you're so happy all the time and stuff. They had no idea that I was battling depression. Now I tell people, hey, this is the reason why I do this. This is the reason why I do that. If I start showing any signs of this, tell me. Um, because, you know, past trauma. And I tell them not to mention certain things because certain things would bring it up and then I would act out again. And um, I'm better now. Good I'm job. finding better ways to cope. So I think just as parenting kids who've been through trauma triggers your own trauma and you find trauma that you didn't even realize you had, uh, the same thing is true of your marriage. Mm -hmm. um, if there's something that's weak, if you know there's problems you didn't even know you had, they it will come up in the process of parenting traumatized children. So many times with parenting children who've been through trauma, you know the the focus then becomes on the kids so much, and we lose ourselves. Um, and and people preach self care, self care, self care, um, and so many times you know it's like well you're going to this therapy, you're going to this, you're going to this. And I remember at one point we were at an adoptive family camp and they had all the therapists that normally work with the kids there and, and they were, we were sitting around the campfire and one of the therapists looked at me and she said, so what do you do for fun? And it was this jaw drop moment, like this profound moment of, I, I don't know, who am I? What, what do I like to do? I don't, I've lost that. Um, and so, it, the same thing can kind of happen with your marriage. I mean, I think even in the last few weeks, we've had a lot of stuff going on, and there were times where it was like, people were asking me questions, and I'm like, I haven't talked to him meaningfully in probably two weeks. I don't know how to answer that because I haven't had a chance to have a discussion. And so a lot of times it can cause huge strain on the marriage, and you will find problems that you didn't know you had. When we're not doing well, we're the family isn't doing, doing well, well, and they don't like the family when we're not working. And so um, we've actually we had have one that will tell us you guys really need to go on a date. Do, do you need to go out on a date? You guys can go on a date tonight. We'll be okay. Like when mom and pop are happy, and they come back home and they're working, we have a happier home life. Parenting in general right. can be tough, and it, it and it can cause conflict. And then when you have just these very intense situations that can come up with trauma and everything um, as a family is dealing with grief and dealing with trauma it can really really you know as you're even trying to navigate what what parenting strategies work and, and people come at it from different angles um, being on the same page being on the same team has never been more important I like to write the chapters of my book, and then I type them. Yeah, he likes to write about Transformers and intertwine them with his life, basically. No. Yeah, it is. You have your Dalton Prime, and then no, you have No, your... that's not me. Then who is it? <laughs> I don't know. Well, you're in it, too. Yeah, I'm Jazz Prime. Yeah. Because it goes perfect with your name. There, there. I... Folks like filter my feelings through writing lyrics and writing songs and drawing. I actually used to be used to write songs for Transfiguring Adoption, and it was called Jasmine's Quill. And I would write songs about my biological home and the questions I had about it. And um, everybody says I, I'm a really good writer, so I but I stopped after a while and I'm starting up again, so that's good. This is Blood by me, Jasmine Fink. I got too much pain, I'm tortured too much, it always ends the same with my face covered in blood. When regret has the whip, he makes sure to hit my face, and guilt aims for my hips, hips when she has her mace. Blood runs in my eyes and I curse at the pain, they laugh because I'm blind, but I take it all anyways. I'm not even in chains when hate swings the bat, I just stand alone and afraid, bracing for his attack. Somebody save me, please. Please make this torture end. I'm too weak, I can't see, and soon the wounds won't mend. Blood runs in my eyes, and I curse in the, at the pain. They laugh because I'm blind, but I can't see through the pain. Regret rip, rips up my face, and he just sits there and laughs. 
Guilt stands with her mace, and I scream as she breaks my back. I lay there bloody and broken, then I feel warmth near the door. Strong, ar strong arms pick me up, and they swing the door open. I am no longer broken, I am no longer blind. God saved me that day, and he's the reason I'm alive. I haven't done music to them yet because I'm still in, you know, in chorus and I'm still learning how to you know, write music, but every song I write, there's a story behind it. Blood is basically about a time when I was dealing with a lot of regret because I had acted out a lot and a lot of guilt, and I hated myself for the longest, for the longest time. The first Harry Potter book, um, they fight a mountain troll and they become close friends. Like they weren't friends before and now they're friends because they fought this mountain troll together. And so we talk about how experiences and, and memories together really help bond. And you know, the kids, they, they talked about in some of the blogs too about not being connected as siblings and then what's brought them together as siblings and stuff. And so moments like, you know, living in Illinois, we'd have nights where we'd have to spend most of the night in the basement because tornado sirens are going off, you know. Um, and so they giggle about remember the, remembering how we had to pretty much spend the night in the closet and so-and-so farted and it stunk really bad and we couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> and so it, it's silly little stuff like that that just kind of eventually becomes the glue that sticks the family together. and those shared memories. With Transfiguring Adoption, we always tell people, we're trying to get people to use movies and books and video games because it's shared experiences again. And not only that, but like in the early days, especially people would ask us, like they wanted to get us gifts or they wanted to get the kids gifts. And we, we would finally got to the point where we're telling people, uh, one, we're running out of room. Two, um, like they haven't been shown, they weren't shown in their home how to take care of things, so they're like, like things aren't things being taken. Like they don't have value. There's, it, they, you know. they don't. Um, thank you so. So we started telling people, can you pay for us to have experiences together? Because that's where we're bonding, and that's where we're connecting, and we're learning how to make a relationship. So we would tell people, we can't afford. There are six of us. We can't afford to go to the movie theaters. Can you get us movie tickets? Uh, we had a zoo by us. We're like, we can't afford to buy lunch in the zoo, which means we have to leave the zoo eat a picnic, which, you know, big deal, a lot of families do it, but if you want to get us something, can you get us, like, zoo bucks so that we can eat in the park, make it easier, um, which will be a big deal for the kids that they get to eat in the park. If you want to get a stuffed animal, don't give them a stuffed animal. Can we get something at Build-A-Bear because then I have to ask them, do you want, which one do you want, what's your favorite color, what's, and we're building something together. It's, it's been a process. It's been, it's been a good process. Our biological mom usually calls or texts our mom, our adoptive mom, and then we talk through her phone. We have very open adoptions, um, lots of contact with extended family from both families. I know. And it's evolved and it looks different over time. Right. But. Margie and one of the mom, well, both of them really, but only, like one of them only really uses the phone regularly like you know you'll share pictures with each other and with one of the moms there's text messaging exchanged probably at least every two or three weeks if not more but with the other one it's a little bit more facebook i remember when we lived in tennessee she came twice to she came twice to um visit us and i remember me like she was just it was really happy to see her and she was supposed to come this year but she, her fiance couldn't get off of work, but we we like you know talk to her sometimes on the phone, and we talk like like she's constantly texting or call like my mom and stuff and seeing how we are, and like se like making sure we know that she loves us and stuff like that, and like we, we can call or text her basically anytime, um, as long as it's you know through our parents and stuff. Going through foster care, being foster parents and then adoptive parents is we we can relate a lot more with parents that are in a divorced situation. 
I don't know if it's something that you always think about when you're getting into foster care or adoption that you have another family in your life now. I don't think we realized how important the birth family and the extended family was going to be for our kiddos when we first started the foster care journey. Because people ask us about like, oh well, you know, if, I'm, if a parent loses their rights or whatever, you just, you're, you're done then, right? You don't have to see them ever. And we're like, I understand that there are times where it's not safe, but at any way that you can, like that relationship needs to stay intact somehow. Um, and it's so important. And I think I didn't realize when we started how important that was. And I, obviously I, I do now. And like our kids like know that if they, if they want to talk to their moms or whatnot, like we'll, we'll make it happen. And, and they have a very open dialogue with us, even back and forth with, uh, you know, I don't feel like talking with my mom right now. I, I just don't. And as the adult, I'm going to feel that. I'm going to handle things for you so that you can decide, are, are you at a place right now where you want to talk to your mom? But I think one thing I didn't anticipate was just kind of the beauty of being able to help maintain that relationship and being able to, I mean, in 2017, when school started, we had six kids um, in Tennessee. We had two fosters. And that day, you know, the first day of school, I was, you know, with three moms between text messaging or Facebook or whatnot, like, here's our kids, you know, first day of school, this is, you know, and being able to share that was just such a beautiful thing um, that, I don't think I ever thought was gonna happen. I am very glad that we still get to stay in contact. Woohoo! I, I think it's very important that you keep the bond with your biological family because it's just like, if you don't really keep that bond, it's like part of you is basically being torn away and you don't really, you can't really connect really well with other people because of that. Do you have any advice for other adopted kids or foster kids? Yes. Before when you go to a foster or like a home that you get adopted, you um, it's a bus ride for a while, and you have to like hang on, and just and um, try to get that second chance that you need. I have a couple of advices. Uh, the first one is, yes, give them a chance. And if you don't like one person, just just spend time with them to get and to know them and stuff. But don't say I hate you right in front of their face. And basically, don't say I hate you to anyone. So don't try to put on a mask, just because you're like, maybe if I act nice or if I try to be this perfect kid, they'll they'll want to adopt me. Be who you are, but also remember that these, pe these are people with feelings. Try to remember that these are people who care for you and that they are trying to give you a better, a better life than what, you, than what you had. And that sometimes you're not going to be able to go back to your biological family. Just be nice and kind to them and they'll be If, if you nice really don't like the person, talk to the, your counselor about it. Talk to people about your feelings, don't hide it in. The second advice is when people, like, oh, another thing. Seriously. Sorry. Don't let anybody look down upon you because you're a foster kid. I will openly tell people, hey, I'm adopted. People can't usually tell because I look so much like my adopted mom. And I think I look a little bit like my adopted dad, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm proud that I was a foster kid and I was given a second chance because I know that there are kids that are in the, around the world who don't get a second chance and have to oh, deal yeah. with all this abuse and stuff until they're basically Safe. their whole lives. Because if well, their father most likely abuses, abuses them, they, probably they will most likely again. fall in love with the guy who's going to abuse them. And abuse their children and stuff like that. So you are fortunate enough to get to a give second, a second chance. chance. <laughs> that was basically the second advice. <laughs>
Wow, Next. I read your mind. We have a lot of people that'll, because they know that we fostered and adopted, they'll ask us, well, I just adopted a child. I haven't told them yet that they're adopted. Um, and they want to know when to tell their child that they're adopted. And we always say, we're like, you haven't told them yet? And we're, they're like, no. And I'm like, okay, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to go home. You're going to sit Susie or whoever down and you're going to have a very open dialogue about how they're adopted tonight. Um, and I've had a lot of, they're like, tonight? And I'm like, well, you should have done it yesterday, but yeah, you're <laughs> going to do it tonight. Because <laughs> um, um, I, I just feel like that open dialogue has to happen um, on well, their I level. now, like, best practices and, and stuff that kids do better when you do have open dialogue. And it's so important. As far as with birth parents, I feel like our ideas have morphed a lot over the years, but... Um, I would say the level of compassion and, you know, I used to write home studies for a while in Tennessee and I would tell people because people would get really on, on birth parents and I said, you realize if you have compassion for these kids, you have to have compassion for their birth parents. Mm -hmm. Most often they were these kids and they didn't get the support or they don't have the resources and they don't have the help that they need and, you know, there are so many things that as college educated um, people with very good support systems, you know, we've tried to navigate some of the systems that birth families have to go through, you know, whether it's, you know, helping get our older children voc vocational rehab services or um, certain, you know, a lot of these like government systems that families, you know, because more often than not, families with their kids in foster care or families who are placing children for adoption, they're dealing a lot of times with poverty and these systems that they have to navigate are nearly impossible. You know, for one of our kids, we spent six months every day for hours on the phone to get vocational rehab set up that ended up, you know, they do it a few months, they find them a job, and oh, we're done. You know, and it's like, we spent six months fighting for this. We had a lot of resources and a lot of things that we were able to access in order to fight for that. And so many times, birth families, they don't have that. Um, they might not understand some of the legal systems or, um, be able to fill out all the paperwork or have the time to spend so many hours on the phone. So many families are fighting this losing battle. It's not like they're like trying to keep you away from your parents. It's because they're, your parents aren't able to like take care of you properly. Yeah, pro yeah properly. One of the biggest things is being an ongoing learner and and being kind of being flexible and, and teachable and always kind of seeking out more information about whatever is best to help our kids. You know, there's being therapeutic, learning about trauma, learning about, um, so, you know, there's so much that's coming up scientifically now that we're learning that happens even in the womb and, and for kids who were adopted at birth who never even touched their mom. There's, there's so much chemically that happens. Um, in the brain, there's changes. And so learning about those things is really important in knowing and understanding our kids better. And sometimes when things are really rough, going back to that and going, okay, there's science behind this. There's reasons, there's reasons for this behavior. There's reasons for this, there's reasons for that. Um, getting to know those things is really important and helpful. I think whenever I meet with foster and adoptive parents, I think the thing that I just want them to know, I just tell them thank you. You need to have those people around you that can tell you thank you. You need to have people around you that can, that can tell you that you're not crazy and you're not alone. Because when we're isolated, that's when we start losing hope. And that's when we mentally and emotionally start breaking down is when we feel like we're alone and we're taking literally the weight of our family and the world on our shoulders. You can't do it. And, and I, I've just met so many amazing people that just they're, they're not going to make the journey. Um, and they could help so many other kids walk through this hard process, uh, but they can't because they feel alone and they're just they're not going to make it. They just they aren't. How did you feel basically whenever, whenever you were adopted? Happy. Really happy? 
Adoption to me is basically having a second chance to basically live a life. normal childhood. It means to be put with good people and the ones that don't abuse you or smoke around you or basically the family that we have now, right Jay? We were lucky that we were adopted at the age that we were because I knew a girl who like we fostered and she has aged out of the system. She's never been adopted. And a lot of the time, you know, people go in, like want to foster and they're thinking, oh, I'm going to get a cute little kid. And they don't realize whenever kids are like around 14 or older, they start to get to the age where they won't, where they're not going to be adopted. And most of the time the kids know that. So, um, I just think we were lucky that we were adopted when we, like, at 22, at age 8 and um, 22, four. 5. Adoption ideally would never have to happen because it is happening. We can help a child heal. You know, and I think in the early days it was, you know, it was about building a family and that kind of thing. And But the more that we've learned about trauma and about the t tearing apart that had to happen in the first place, you know. I mean, I've told our kids before, I said, I would rather you not be adopted. I would rather you not have had to go through this, um, you know, because all adoption and foster care, there's loss. Even the idea of foster care and adoption has morphed a lot for us. The more we've learned and, and grown and experienced and gotten to know people, on all sides of the journey. And as we've had experiences and learned more and, and really grown to have a lot more compassion and empathy for birth families and you know, learning more about just kind of the struggles that families face with foster care or even placing an infant for adoption. Um, there's so many battles and struggles that are so insurmountable for so many people that you know, it really has become for us more about helping a family and, and doing whatever we can to help that first family stay intact. And then if that's absolutely not possible, how can we just extend family and keep those connections and have the child in a safe, protected place? My mom is, she is sweet, she is kind and loving and she's willing to sacrifice everything for us. My dad is creative and he like, yeah, he's very artistic. <laughs> and he is always looking for a way like, how can we like do this better or something, something like that. I was about to say the same thing she said. <laughs> well, my adoptive mother is really sweet and kind. And she actually sacrifices everything for us if needed. And my dad is artistic. He was an artist for a couple of years. And he's very kind. I feel most loved, like, like us as a family. We love each other. And just love, love yeah, just love each other as a family. What do my kids mean to me? Oh, that's deep. <laughs> okay. Wow. I'm trying to find words. I know, it's like that overwhelming feeling of emotion they can't put into words. Right. Like, I'm like, okay, if you can just show, like, here, there, that's where, like, just see my heart and emotions? There we go. Have you ever watched the, the um, Christmas um, DuckTales TV show? And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and <laughs> so I was, I was thinking that, um, song. And it says, Cap Chris Kringle. <laughs> you know, Cap Chris Kringle doesn't sound right either. Jasmine. Like cap him? Like, like shoot him? Like shoot Chris Pringle? This is not the DuckTales I grew up with. Dad, how about we watch the episode so we can see it? How about you eat your food? I get all the rule stuff. Mm -hmm. Not a president. Good yeah. We've never had a female president. 
Okay, we went from Cap Chris Kringle. <laughs> so what have our kids added to our lives? I can't imagine life without them. Just fun. Like, they've added so much fun. Yeah. And, and work and stress and everything else, but so much fun and, and joy and richness. I feel like when we started our family, it was it would have been just a superficial just saying we are a family and in that we live under the same household and I am the father figure, you are the mother figure, um, and they are the brother sister figures and we all coexist together. But after so many experiences and different things that we've gone through together, family It was hard fought. Very it's family hard that's fought. very hard fought. Having grown up in a traditional home, I, I think that it, the ties almost feel stronger because it's all of us having to work together um, to figure out how to be there for each other. We've seen each other at our worst, we've seen each other at our best, and it's such a good thing because we're all still here and we all love each other and we're all still accepting. It's a beautiful battle that we're all fighting to get to the same place. I don't even know how to go, where to go from there. <laughs> it's, there's, it is hard to put all of that emotion into, into words. Help me out. <laughs> I'm at a loss. We are totally different people than who we were um, when our kids first came to us. We've learned and grown so much. And even our passions, our goals, our dreams, our expectations, everything has changed. Um, you know, from career goals to um, just how we see the world. And I feel like we're better people because we're of better, our kids. Yes, we're definitely better people because of our kids. And they've just, they're, there's so much joy, there's so much fun, um, lots and lots of struggle and hurt as well, but but I feel like that's made us more human, and that's made, that's why we are better people. I don't know how else to say it. We're more human, we're more accepting of people, and we're better for it. I want to say that I have no anger towards my mother. I love both of my moms. It's weird but cool to, say I, to be able to say I have two moms. And I actually see me going into foster care as a blessing, and where people do care about you, and they care about you enough to get you out of a living nightmare. And I'm proud that I'm a foster child. I am proud that I'm adopted. I am proud of who I am. And I am just happy with the person I've become.